All right, here comes part two. Uh, here I'm just uh, putting in the shelf that I cut. Uh, the shelf, I just take the inside measurements and make sure that it's uh, at least an eighth of an inch behind. That way uh, it does give the drawers or any type of, anything that's out of square, uh, it, it'll give it a little bit of breathing room in terms of being able to shut the doors and not having them stick out. So it's gonna be important for later. Now here I'm just uh, making sure that uh, I'm, I'm using a punch tool and a hammer just to make sure that all my finished nails, brads, and basically anything that I use to shoot into the project is below the surface. And uh, again, this is just a punch tool and a hammer. I'm just gonna line them up and you know, you can use a hammer if you'd want, but you're, you're gonna do a lot more finished work to hide those hammer marks. So I don't recommend it. Invest in some punch tools. All right, now right here, I'm just uh, using a round over bit. It has a little bearing on it. I'm using my hand router here. And the edging here, my wife is pointing out, even though I knew I didn't want it to be like that, that it was incorrect. I'm sure we've all been there. And uh, of course, I did another round of it, and uh, I made sure that it was just, just enough. So I got that just a round edge and no other pattern into it. And then of course, I'm gonna set up and do the actual piece so that was a test piece now we're going to do the actual and this is pretty forgiving so you start it up you go down you can go back and forth all you want it's not going to mess it up so something to consider you just need that that bit that round over bit with the ball bearing on it And here we're just gonna putty up the holes with some wood filler. Uh, you can see I got quite a bit there. You wanna keep the cover on these wood fillers. They dry out quick. And uh, I'm just using my finger and I just keep rubbing back and forth until it doesn't even surface. Um, for some reason, I found this way best. Uh, essentially, it just makes it for a lot less sanding down the road. And then of course, if there's any imperfections, I just come in and do it again after I've sanded. And uh, it gives a seamless look. You can't even see where those uh, nails are actually in the project. Now here, I'm just doing the finish work. Uh, finish work is very, this is a very important step. So once you got your, um, everything filled, you're gonna sand down with the 120. You're gonna go over with the tack cloth, look for any more imperfections. You're gonna go over it again with any putty that you need to fill. After that, you're gonna hit it with a 150 or a 180. It doesn't matter here. I just I just kind of use what I have. And then after that, uh, if there's any more imperfections, I just hit it finally with a 220. <clears throat> and then that tack cloth is gonna be really important. Uh, the tack cloth is, of course, a tacky cloth that picks up any dust. The best practice is to vacuum the project first with like a shop vac and a brush. And you know you wanna go lightly and then you go over with the tack cloth. So the vacuum will get most of it, the tack cloth will get anything that's, you know, was persistent and sticking to the project. And then of course, as you're going through, you saw I had to grab a hammer and punch again. It's just a nail that I missed and you just whack them in real quick and then you can putty while you're doing it. Here, I'm just getting ready to sand. Uh, actually, no, no, for, for this spot right here, uh, we're, I'm gonna show you a trick, but <clears throat> the this needs to be sanded down after being finished and there's this gap in the front and I've, I've basically put wood glue down and now I'm going to uh, rub it in a little bit and then sand over it 
and this works great. It works better than any wood filler, anything at all. And it's a great trick. I've learned it from other carpenters and it just gets rid of any unsightly gaps. And then of course, when you're putting on your finish, uh, if you've sanded well and, and you know made everything even, you're not gonna notice that, barely notice that seam at all. And that's uh, something, it's a great trick that works excellent. I highly recommend doing that. And of course now we're going to hit this with uh, the 180 grit sandpaper I believe this is. We're going to go through the whole project. We're going to sand anything out. You remember that I put back front, forward, bottom on, on the inside. I'm going to go in and sand that out too. Some of it I have to sand out by hand. Uh, I actually have to bring it into the shop and because I didn't have the vacuum attachment yet, um, I have Tesla ba solar batteries now so I have to do whatever I can to keep the dust down inside and that's what I do. Everything, all my work now is done outside, so winter projects are going to be interesting. And this is me just going through with the hand sander. Um, you know, I'm going to go through with the vacuum. The va vacuum has a HEPA filter and then the tack cloth. And uh, I've noticed that I haven't really had any dust issues in, in my garage, which, um, you know, is nice. So here we're using a Benjamin Moore uh, Aurora Paint, low VOC, really nice, uh, it doesn't have a primer in it though, but the coverage is, is a two coat coverage, it's really good. So we're going to go over and just use a roller, we're going to use a brush on any of the um, 90 degrees or, or, or any part of the project where the roller can't address. So um, that's, that's something to keep in mind when you're doing this project. Uh, you're going to need a brush and a roller. You can't just do just a roller. Uh, painting is really the bane of my existence. I, I hate painting. And of course I'm always getting caught up in paint projects. Uh, so this is more of a detail work. So you just want to go slow. You don't want to get too much on the brush. So you're just going to get the, the tip as close as you can to the edge without going over. And then you're just going to slowly keep pulling the paint out. And then when you're done you can kind of give it a, a wipe in the front like I just did right there. To, to clean up any excess so you don't get any um, you know, drips or drops. But uh, it is something that it just takes some time and some attention to detail. And if you're careful, you won't get any inside. But if you don't want to be careful and you, you feel like taking the time, you can take. Uh, I, I haven't had, I've, I've had hit and misses with tape. So sometimes it works great and then other times it doesn't. But I, I prefer this method, just taking my time. And then of course, if uh, anything spills over, you know, I can just uh, go back and wipe it up, especially if you finish the inside with like a, either a lacquer or water-based poly. Um, that would, you know, if any paint does get inside, you can just wipe it up because the wood's now sealed. You're not going to have to deal with it. But uh, I didn't do that, so uh, I did not have any issues, and that's something I always look forward to. But again, the painting and the time it takes, um, painting just takes a long time, and it's this detail part that really adds the time to it.
Okay, now I've already vacuumed this. This is the middle part of the tabletop. I'm gonna hit it with the tack cloth one last time. I'm gonna check for any high or rough spots that can wreck the finish. And then I'm just gonna start right and move left. I'm using a poly shades, but this is the Home Depot brand. Um, I actually forget what it's called, but it's a um, stain and poly mix. I'm going with a gloss. Uh, the first coat went on really rough, so you put your hand over the surface, it felt like sandpaper. I, of course, hit it after that with a 220, uh, and then kept putting on coats until it was smooth. So I did about three coats. So I hit it with a 220, then a 320, and then uh, I started hitting it with 400. And then when the, so this is each, each coat is a poly coat, a polyurethane coat. And, but it's also a color layer. So what I'll do at the end of this is I will put on a gloss finish of oil-based polyurethane. Now I prefer oil-based for a desktop because you can get in one or two coats of that um, clear coat the, the coverage that you need. And it goes on thick. So if you use a water base, it's not that you can't use a water base, but you're looking at about seven to eight coats to get what I can get with uh, an oil base. The problem is is the off gassing. So this is going to off gas for about two weeks uh, or as long as 30 days. And so what's going to happen is within 24 hours it's going to dry and you're going to be able to every, every um, six hours you can apply another coat and um, you know but 24 hours it's, it's going to be dry and then over time the molecules or the molecular structure I forget what the, how they explain it but what's going to happen is is over the 30 days it's going to really set up and then after it stops off gassing that's around the time that it's reached the hardness that it's going to reach for the life of the project so something to keep in mind You've probably also noticed in that initial, my first video where I show you the setup being completed, um, that I do, you know, a bit of gaming here. I do my editing here, and I gotta say, I tried after two weeks of sitting here, and it was still off gassing, and I was getting some headaches. <laughs> so it does take time. You're gonna have to be patient with the oil base. If you don't want to put up with that, and within 24 hours on a on a water base, uh, I forget what the the reapply code is. I think you can do it in a couple hours. But um, you're not going to have to wait that long. You still have to wait the 30 days for it to set up just like the oil base. But uh, it's, it's, you're not going to deal with the off gas. And then here's that sanding step that I showed you. I'm, I'm using a sanding block. Uh, they work fantastic. But I just hit it with, uh, two, this is the 220, then the 320, then the 400, and then steel wool um, for my poly coats. Uh, it works great. It's gonna knock down all the high spots. You're gonna notice it's gonna get all scratched up and that's fine. The next poly layer is gonna fill all that in and you're gonna have nothing to worry about. Uh, one thing to note, if you're working in a garage at night, um, keep the doors closed make sure that it's screened because I had bugs flying in at night something I didn't have to deal with during the day they got into the poly and they ruined it and I had to go back and repair it all right now we're starting the shelves so the shelves uh, that go right or left of my monitors are being built right now this is a 17 inch by 39 and a quarter that's based on the bulkhead that's above the desk and the uh, this is a pretty easy straightforward you do have to stagger your routes so when routing it out um, one side has to be different than the other for the back so if you don't do that unfortunately what's going to end up happening is uh, you'll have two right sides or two left sides so so just something to keep in mind so you're gonna have to stagger that and then I do all dado cuts and you're gonna have to obviously adjust your measurements for that
So these are the routes I was just talking about, um, you know, just marking my lines, uh, using the rail system to guide the router, and then I use the three quarter inch bit. It's one pass. Uh, you do have to go slow with these hand battery powered Ryobi routers. Uh, they tend to bind up and quit. And you know, I had to restart a couple of times because I went too fast. And then you see that circle I get at the bottom because it shifted at the end. So you just want to hold it steady. Don't rely too much on the wood because you'll get those circles and uh, you know they're not that big of a deal but with wood glue and making sure that it's you know setting up correctly and every part is holding together you know you want that surface to be flat as possible and um, that's you know when you do that there's no fixing it other than some filler you could use some uh, bondo filler uh, but you know I just kind of leave it and you know use brads that crisscross so I'll do one, one from the side and then one straight down and then that way it's really not going to go anywhere and then of course the wood glue is really going to let it set up and, and add some strength. All right, and here we go with building the shelves to the right or left of the desk. Um, these are pretty robust shelves. They're, they have a 17 inch depth minus the route. And then of course, uh, that half inch there where I'm gonna put a board. Here we have the positioning squares that I'm uh, just using to make sure I can get the, the boards in a good position. And they are, they are invaluable. I, I really, I know I've said it before, I'm going to invest that, uh, recommend that you invest in them. And uh, they made the job go a lot quicker, especially with all the camera setup time and repositioning. And it's, they're, they're just a handy tool to have and uh, pretty inexpensive. You can get them on Amazon. Uh, I went with the Relatech positioning squares. And here I'm just putting that uh, half inch back plate on. I was a lot happier with this. I, I gotta say, if you remember seeing, I, I had other ones that, that didn't they didn't pan out so well, and uh, the way this went in was so much better, and I was so happy the way that this one came out. And even though I used uh, some finishing nails, we are uh, we're gonna use clamps. We're gonna make sure that this clamps up good. We're gonna leave that on there for a little bit and uh, just make sure that this is gonna hold tight together. We're not just gonna rely on those nails. Uh, wood glue is amazing, and uh, you know the, the clamps are always a good idea. I picked these up at Harbor Freight, and they were pretty inexpensive, but uh, still a hit to the budget. They were about 20, 20 bucks a pop.
All right, so here I'm just actually gonna cut a hole for wiring. Um, I cut a hole down from the top piece um, down over across so I could get all the way to the left by the power outlet. Now, this is the part that I'm talking about where I had some delaminating. And delaminating is just a bubble in your finish because underneath it has separated from the wood. And it's really problematic and I've had it, here I had it the most with uh, poplar finished plywood than I've ever had before. Uh, typically I use birch and birch I, I can't remember having a problem. Either I've lucked out or poplar is problematic plywood. So I'm gonna always recommend birch. So I'm just taking that area that's delaminated. This is a two and a half inch hole saw. I'm gonna cut down. I gotta go through two layers. And so I have to, you know, remove um, the layer that I took out first before going down to the second. And then once I'm through, I'm gonna vacuum up and then I'm gonna take that off. You wanna be careful here in case some of the finish started to separate, in case some of that area is delaminated because if you pull too hard, and it pulls away, you could really ruin the finish. You're gonna to have to start from scratch. You're gonna to have to go back and finish that and fix it. And it's not fun, but I wor it worked out there. Now here I'm opening up a box. This box has the uh, monitor mount. So I'm gonna show you this monitor mount. I was originally gonna to mount to the wall, but the mounts were just way too expensive. Um, this mount set me back about $120. It was on sale on Amazon. And it's pretty straightforward to put together. Um, the only problems that you may have is your monitors. And your monitors uh, need to utilize the VersaMount, something Samsung isn't really good at. I, I gotta tell you, I'll never, I'll never buy a Samsung monitor again after the trouble I've had with them. But this is straightforward. Right now I'm just taking all the pieces out, setting them down so you can see what it consists of. And also so I can see what it consists of. And you basically, at this part, you're just gonna count all the pieces you need. You wanna make sure that everything's there, and then you can proceed. If nothing, if not everything's there, of course, you're gonna have to call the company and get those parts sent out to you. All right, so you're gonna see the way I designed this desk. I designed the middle to be able to get pulled out. That way I can get this uh, desk mount in there. And you can see in the back that I've actually routed out a small section of that just so I can do that. And I, I went about uh, a half inch to three quarters of an inch in the back just so I had space for wires and then of course I had the measurement for the mount and I expanded that measurement on the other side again for wiring and anything um, that I would need so I wouldn't have to drill through the main part of the desk. I might have to later on if I keep the keyboard up top I just like uh, hidden wires and it just means I'm gonna have to you know drill probably an inch and a half inch hole in the middle of that. All right, here's an instance where I forgot to turn on the camera. So um, I got that right piece in and it's a good thing that you didn't see it because my wife comes down and points out that it looks completely out of whack and then you step back and it really does. Um, so I, what I had to do is uh, pull it out and start over. 
and you'll see that happen in a second. I use a 45 degree here. I actually flip everything around and instead of that seam being on the left there, it's now on the right. But I was able to use everything over again. And uh, you know, that was, that was good. But uh, essentially there's some trickery of the eye here. There's a one inch drop from left to right. And you usually use this face frame. So you create your um, shelves to be the same size. Whatever gap is going to be there is going to be there. And then from there, you're going to use that face piece I'm putting in to do some trick of the eye for that wall drop. So that way it looks level. It looks like everything's the way it's supposed to be, even though behind it, it isn't. So I'll eventually put some RGB lighting. Uh, and I've actually had some people taking a look at the desk. Um, they can't believe how much lights are already on it. <laughs> so... But here you see me, I'm removing it. My, my wife has just pointed out the problem. I've spotted it and decided that it did need correcting. So um, it's, uh, you know, don't be afraid to start over or, or to correct something because you're gonna have to live with it the entire time. And if you have to look at it, you know, you always say you're gonna fix it, but the best time is to do it now. Okay, face frame time. So uh, here you just want to be careful with any imperfections in the wood. In the front, I had, there was actually a piece, and I'll explain where that is later. But uh, I did have to do a lot more finish work than I would have liked. And uh, you know, you just got to watch for the pieces of wood that you're using and make sure that they're uh, sanded and filled to the so so that they look nice and smooth when uh, you do paint them up because you are going to notice any imperfections.
And here I just wanted to show you how I uh, painted the shelves. And you know, just uh, here I just used a roller. I really didn't have to worry about anything else. I, I, I get it all the way around, uh, except on the left and right. I didn't, I didn't see a need to paint that. You want to be careful here with the coat. You don't want to go too thick with it because it, at the ends, you know, it can tack up and it, it can just cause problems with fitting your shelf. So, um, you know, you just go light with it. You don't have to go too, too much, too heavy on it. You're really going to cause problems with that. And of course, down the road, if you know, there's spots that you missed or, you know, that look thin, you can always go back and add another coat. All right, there's gonna be some shaky camera work here. There's uh, nothing I could do, but I'm just here. I'm just kind of showing. Um, this is maple, so I'm using um, other pieces of wood to for my measurement. And again, this is a, a little bit shaky camera work here, but I'm trying to show you what I'm doing. Is I just kind of draw a line, and then I'm gonna use the miter saw, and I'm going to cut just in front of that line. And then I'm gonna keep using the other piece of wood to essentially get the, ac the most accurate um, measurement that I can get to the first. And so I, I do this because I was having a lot of uh, consistency issues by just measuring it out as opposed to using the other piece of wood. Some people say that this will get less accurate as you go on, but if you keep using the other piece and making sure that, I mean, it's flush on a flush surface, Again, you got to make sure that your miter, miter saw is um, cutting square. But you can see I'm gonna, I'm just gonna feel the top of these. I'm gonna put them on a flush surface. I'm gonna say, oh, okay, there's a 32nd to a 16th left. Okay, I'm gonna go confirm that there's uh, how much is left. And then once I get, okay, it's supposed to be nine inches. It's nine and a sixteenth. I have to take a sixteenth off. I'm just gonna take 30 seconds off at a time. Usually one or two cuts and you really just want to go slow because you want these to be as accurate as possible. Why is that? Well, I'm making inset cabinets. So here I'm showing you what I'm actually making. So to make the inset cabinet, you have to essentially take uh, an eighth of an inch or a sixteenth of an inch, depending on, on the size that you want. I took an eighth of an inch off and I was still off. Um, and I, I triple checked these measurements and then I had to use a planer to get some of it down or I had to take um, them apart. So what you actually saw me with was a, a pine piece, a pine template, so I could essentially install and see what kind of issues I was having so I could make my adjustments on the front. So on the final, that's if you have extra lumber hanging around and I did. And this this stuff that I had hanging around. It's funny, if I had known I had it, I probably would have used it for the face frame instead of maple, but um, it, it was really a, uh, a good piece of lumber that I had. It seems nice and straight and nice and flat. But this is the template, and I'm just explaining, you know, like you need to kind of make sure that that inset is gonna be um, exactly what you need, that the, the spacing is gonna be correct. If it isn't, you're gonna be constantly adjusting. So, 
Here we're making the shaker style door using the pocket hole method. You can see I've already drilled the pocket holes for this. I'll show you I'll show you me drilling the pocket holes when I do the um, file cabinet, but you know I'm just gonna use a little bit of wood glue on the end grain there. I'll make sure that it's in there on the um, you know kind of spread out with my finger. And then I'm using a fine thread screw or a pocket hole screw. And you know, I'm just gonna keep doing the clamp and making sure that everything's nice and flush, nice and square. And once this is done, we can go on to routing. So here I'm just using my router with the quarter inch routing bit and I'm just gonna, it has the, again there's that ball bearing that prevents me from going too far over. Um, this likes to jump here and there and if you don't do the clamps right obviously you'll get stuck up on those. But you know just real quick if it works right you're taking it, it's uh, about a quarter inch gap maybe, maybe a little more than that. Now we're going to cut our MDF. Now you can use um, plywood, quarter inch plywood if you want. Everyone told me to use MDF and I did. I originally tried attaching this with a staple uh, staple gun. Staple gun didn't work so well. And I, I ended up using pins. But I didn't glue any of it because I wanted that to be able to move around a little bit. And uh, you know it is, the wood's going to expand and contract, nothing I can do about that. But, um, you know, everyone just said, you know, either use a staple gun or, or uh, brads or pins. I, I couldn't find brads small enough. I needed half inch. But the pins I was able to find. And even though I did three quarters of an inch, uh, nothing came through. So I lucked out. All right, here I'm just cutting the MDF to size. And what I'm just going to do is this is the last part of the MDF that I'm going to cut. I'm going to cut the corners off to make sure that it can fit within that space. Now when attaching this, uh, I ended up using pins. I do try a staple gun initially, and that didn't end up working out. You can see it's a DeWalt. Uh, I put the, the maximum amount of um, force that I could on that staple, and they still wouldn't go in. So I ended up having to rethink, and I had a pin nailer, a Ryobi one, and I ended up using that to attach them, and it worked, it worked fantastic. I might have some issues down the road with it coming apart, but um, you know, if I do, I'll just have to get uh, better staples or thinner staples. But uh, I was having a huge pain of a time getting that to, to actually work. Here I'm using a Craig jig tool for European style hinges. I'm just gonna put the tool, to, I'm gonna center it, uh, or, or basically make sure that it's flush with the ends and then I drill my hole. I did do a couple tests on this to make sure, because there, there are gap settings. And uh, I think I went with a three. But <clears throat> I think that was because the hinges that I got weren't, uh, weren't working out and I had to adapt them. So that's what ended up working for that space. So I'm just gonna keep going through this through all the doors. I do the same thing for every single one. And uh, it works out fairly uh, it, this jig it works very well and I highly recommend uh, investing in one all right now we're just getting ready to mount the hinges you just want to make sure that, that they're horizontal and you know as, as square as possible what can end up happening is if you do attach them and they're a little bit out of whack is when you go to attach them that they, they either won't attach to the mount or they'll be so tight that you won't be able to close the door and I actually have an issue with that on one of them and I think that's just the, the adjustment issue uh, that I'll show you in a, in a second. But you can adjust them back, forward, up, down, and even, you know, they can push out and pull in a little bit. Very, very, I, I love these hinges because they're just so versatile in terms of what you can do and making sure that they fit. Especially with inset hinges. Inset hinges, uh, inset doors 
which is what we're doing here, can be really, really, if you're off by so much as a little bit, you're having to take stuff, material off of the cleaner, and then it might not even look square when you're done. And that's, it's just an eyesore. So I do like these types of hinges. That's why we run with them. But, uh, you know, there, there's a method to install them. Okay, so when I went to install these hinges, uh, I thought I had bought the correct ones. But there's a couple things you need to know about building cabinets. There is frameless, and there is framed. Now, with frames, there's typically three quarter, three, a three quarter inch overhang to an inch overhang. And I didn't do that, I made everything flush because I, didn't, I was doing inset doors, I didn't want any overhangs, and it really came back to bite me because when I went to buy the hinges, no one really made anything for that that I noticed. And that was a pain in the butt. So what ended up happening, I ended up having to adapt these with a piece of MDF until I can get uh, the correct hinges. Everyone tells me they make them, but I can't find them at Home Depot, uh, Rockler, nowhere. So I, I've been having a uh, tough time even getting the, the hinges that I want, and everyone is always bringing up well, is it frameless or is it frame? And I say frame. Well, this one should work because it's frame. You know, the frame needs an overhang. And I did flush. Now, I, I used the frame to hide the plywood. And everyone was telling me what you should have done is just use a veneer. So the thing is, remember, when I was telling you earlier, my uh, my cuts were a little out of whack by a quarter to an eighth of an inch. And that would have affected uh, the what... It would have essentially affected the face frame without this three-quarter inch piece. With this three-quarter inch piece, I was able to adjust and fill with, um, you know, caulking to make it look nice. Now, uh, you know, I'm, I'm telling you all the time, I have to show you the all the imperfections that were not perfect over here. You know, you can get plenty of perfection on other channels. I want to show you how to adapt to problems. And you can fix those problems down the road, but if you're trying to get something done, you're gonna have to you're gonna have to think about it and make adjustments. Now here I'm building the file cabinet uh, drawer face plates for our shaker style. And this is just me showing you how I do it with uh, the Craig jig. You know, basically I bring it to the, the edge of the Craig jig, and then you know I use the the holes on either side to the right or the left, not the middle one. <clears throat> and I drill a hole and really easy you know you want to go up and down a couple times make sure that that's clear and uh, you know if you got to set your depth so if you're dealing with three quarter inch material you need to make sure it's three quarter inch and you also got to set the um, the top of that drill there's an allen wrench um, screw that you'll be able to adjust that um, that uh, cyl cylindrical piece to uh, act as a stop gap or a guard from going too deep and then here I just show you me gluing them up, the Craig Jig clamps, and then uh, you know I install. I ran out of the fine thread screws. I had to go to the other ones, but uh, you know this is just me piecing those together, and then I'm going to rub these up. Now I tried cutting these up with just the, the, the circular saw and whatever aggravation. This is me making the drawers. And I needed accurate cuts, as accurate as could be. And my other cuts were coming off, the, I mean, 16th to a 32nd, but it was a problem. So this, I was able to get the cuts exactly the way I wanted. And uh, I, I believe it's, uh, I'm trying to remember my measurements here. 19 and a half by eight and a half for the sides, and then 12 and a half in the middle, and then oh no, it was 12 and a 16th in the middle, and then at the bottom. So when you do the bottom plate, it's, th it's 19 and a half by 13 and a 16th. So <clears throat> pretty straightforward. 
but you know the measurements on that you, know, you got to get accurate you want to make sure that the box that you're going to make is square and the height that you're doing is actually for a file so if you're wondering if a file folder is going to fit in this where they have those overhangs and they just kind of hang there this will accommodate for that all right now coming up i'm going to make sure that these are completely square you're going to see me using a planer and uh, you know some of these weren't as square as i thought they were going to be and i just said that i needed really accurate cuts i was taking maybe 30 seconds to 60 fourths off of these and it wasn't much but remember i wanted to make sure that these were perfect and they did they came out great a little attention to detail can go a long way and having these planers is something that you should invest in for this tiny one i believe it was 10 15 dollars it was well worth the investment because i was able to perfect things with the planer so you can't always rely on your miter circular or table saw cuts being accurate but if you go a little bit over on the measurements, bit, not over on the measurements, but over on the cut, just a little, little bit, um, <clears throat> any, so some of these were accurate to not accurate. So that means that if I needed something 8 inches, one side was 8 inches and then the other side was 8 inches and a 16. So that's out of square and of course I can take that 16th off, really easy to do. Now I set up the camera up top, you can see it wiggling here. And then I just put everything together with some wood glue. I use uh, a little bit smaller version of those um, square uh, pieces that I have that, to make sure that it's square. And I can make these on Amazon. And then I just use my Brad uh, nailer to <clears throat> to nail into the to the piece of wood. You can see I, for, I forgot to reload it, but um, you know, pretty straightforward. And you're just going to do each side and then put on the bottom piece once you've made sure it's square. And that bottom piece, if it's square. You don't really even have to mess around with anything. You just slap it on, put some wood glue on the bottom, shoot some more brads into the bottom. I believe the brads that I'm using here are, um, I think that they're inch and a quarter in for, uh, brads, if not one inch. So you can go with either of those, but pretty, pretty straightforward again, using this uh, some clamps and that square tool, it just makes everything so easy. I highly recommend it. Alright, so now I'm doing my um, file drawer mount. Uh, I picked these in, these uh, drawer slides up on Amazon. They are the soft clothes. They're 20 inches long. I didn't go with 22 or 23 inches, although I could have. Uh, but the problem that I would have run into was those wires in the back. I didn't want the drawers being interfered with. Now, with these, with these, um, these, File, uh, the file drawer rails that I'm putting in. There is a screw hole that essentially is uh, going to be longer and <clears throat> you can do that for the vertical or the horizontal. So for the horizontal I went with those so I could slide them back and forth and then of course the back screw doesn't have any of that so you will have to un undo the back screw if you need to adjust. But these are going to go flush to where the cabinet meets the face frame and that's going to give you that three quarter inch gap for the inset cabinet. I see I'm getting ready to mount and uh, you know I'm just gonna use that eighth inch of those paint sticks to keep my my gap and then I'm gonna attach the front first I don't think I use the, the screw hole I'm telling you about first here I do okay so that's the one I'm talking about and that'll allow me to slide it back and forth if I need to here I'm just using my Craig gig now you see I'm making sure that it's level of course your project has to be level otherwise you know, you could have some problems there um, and then the, these clamps, they, I mean, it works great. Uh, I use the file drawer to give me the gap and the spacing that I want. And then using the, the Craig Jig um, file drawer hang, uh, hanger jig, I can, 
I can mount everything that I need to mount. And it just makes it really easy. I really recommend a lot of these Craig Jude tools and a lot of them are inexpensive. I believe these were about 20 bucks. I know, you know, a lot of people can't swing that, but if you're doing this project, it's, it's worth it. It's, I highly recommend it. I try to go with as minimal tools as possible or cheap tools that I know that people can buy. You know, I'm not going to recommend these huge, huge table saws that are like $1,500, $1,600. So here I'm just using my uh, orbital sander. You can see that I've filled everything uh, for the pocket holes with a maple plug. And then I just sand them down. Uh, I think I used an 80 grit to sand those down. And then I go to, I believe, a 120, then to uh, a 180. And then I just sand everything, make sure it looks nice. Uh, I tend to leave the uh, MDF alone a little bit. I Sometimes I'll hit it with a 220, but you can see here, I'm, I'm just going over those those rough edges around the, the pocket holes and making sure that everything's nice and flush and uh, it's gonna look nice even when I open it. So I, I just hate when I open cabinets and there's that unsightly hole there and there here I don't have to deal with that. And if it's done well enough, you might not even see it at all. And moving back to our paint, we're just going to use a brush to get into the corners, make sure that the inside of that shaker door has good coverage, and then we're just going to use a roller to do the rest. We're going to do front and back. You want to give about 20 to 45 minutes for that to set up. That's what I usually do. Some people come in longer, some people, but we'll go shorter. But uh, you just so it's not tacky, you just want to wait till it's not tacky, and then you can um, manipulate it. If it's any, there's any tackiness to it at all, just leave it alone and try a little bit more. And I'll actually even stick a dehumidifier in my car to help it dry especially in the summer months when it can get humid, it just, it makes all the world a difference. And here come the reshoots. So I, I didn't get the camera footage for this, so I'm actually just taking the finished product and trying to show you, uh, you know, just how you are gonna mount them. You see that these work great. Now I'm gonna open this up and I'm gonna show you there's um, three different screws. One pulls it in and out, so forward and back. One goes up and down, and then the other will move into the cabinet and then away from, so basically it'll push the, the whole door inward or take it out and that this is what this is where these hinges really shine and I really love these hinges because of this feature it makes it so easy I, I, I can't I, I can't give praise to these these hinges enough for how easy it is if I was off so much as a little bit I would be grumbling yelling they, they just make it work and so now, moving on, I, you can see I already drilled the hole. But essentially, I think I go down two and, two and three quarters and then an inch and what's uh, two and a half. What's, what's half of that? So I think it's like a, so this is an inch uh, and a quarter. And you're just gonna center that and then drill the hole and then put on your hardware. Now. The hardware for this worked perfect, but for your file cabinets, you might run into a problem. You might want to pick up some three-quarter inch screws for file cabinets, because it'll come with an inch, and I think an inch and three quarters, or it's, it's pretty long. So here you can just see me taking the measurement for you, showing you what I did. You just mark it with a pencil, try to get it centered, and then uniform with all your
All right, so this is just me showing you what I did to um, drill these holes. You can actually still see the line that I had. The hardware that I, I uh, had, I didn't have to cover this line up or paint over it or erase it. But, uh, you know, you're going to make sure that's 9 inches. So half of 9 inches is 4.5 would be center. And then you're going to measure down from the top whatever you think is center. So your file face frames, um, these shakers, they're all going to be different, you know, based on what you want. Um, so with this, I, I do measure from the top in this video, but you actually want to go from the shaker style door down and you want to be a little above center. And uh, I don't remember the, the measurement. Actually, this was three and an eighth. So it's three and an eighth down and on either side, it's going to be another three and an eighth. So that's how I got that. And, you know, just drill the hole after you're done and mount these. I did use a pin nailer initially. If you don't have a pin nailer, you can use a clamp. You're gonna need someone to hold it. And that can be frustrating because this is an inset door. But that's the video. All right, everyone, uh, I did lose some of the camera footage at the end, but I hope that this was uh, a good experience in showing you how I went about creating my version of the Logan desk that I uh, found online. Uh, I was originally planning on something similar to this, only I was gonna do one big cabinet door on either side and then the file cabinets just made more sense um, but yeah this is the Logan desk or my take on it and this is how I went about making it guys if you like the video please like share and subscribe if you didn't like the video give me a thumbs down I know that there's always stuff that I can do better and uh, you know sometimes I make these videos and I feel like there's a lot lacking and it isn't justified here I lost a lot of footage at the end and unfortunately, you know, those, some of those finer details. Guys, if you have any questions on, on the things that are missed, just message me. I'll take the time and I'll see about getting you uh, some information so you, your project can come out just as good as this, if not better. So I'm Joel with Second DIY. You have a good day.